Once But Not Now was written by S. Reagan on the SCP Wiki. You can find a link to it in the description below, and it is under a Creative Commons Sharealike Attribution 3.0 license. Sometimes, when he closed his withered eyelids, the old man could see the prairies of his youth. Moonlit grasses, he could feel and hear the gentle whiskers of the wind against his flesh. But that was long ago. Sometimes when he dreamed, he would forget that he was old and leap through these fields, shrieking with the elemental joy of existence. There were others there, young, like he was in the dream. Their faces are blurry, but heartbreakingly familiar. And it felt wrong to have forgotten them. And then he would wake again see the corroded metal walls of his prison. Technically, he wasn't bound to the cell. He could leave at any time. He just had to get up and walk out. But beyond, the world had changed into something lunatic. It was too bright, too complex, as though it had been designed to confuse and daze him. Burning white lights, random surfaces at dizzying intervals, so that the air seemed to drown or choke him. It had not been this bad when they first brought him to this dismal place, or maybe it was him who had changed. His faculties dispersing themselves into the suffocating walls. And so here he stayed. He tried to take refuge in fantasy, losing the present as he had lost so much of the past, but those open prairies were becoming harder and harder to recall of his own volition. Instead, he found himself walking endless, twisted corridors, doors sagging with decay and dark, damp mold dripping from the ceiling. He wondered whether it was the ruin of his own mind he was imagining. He'd been young once. He remembered his mother, his siblings, though in his mind they had become mixed with his children and how they had played amongst the trees and in the open prairies. He had been taught how to hunt. In those days, prey had been plentiful. No, not plentiful. Easier to catch. His mother had brought him an old, tattered one, alive, to show him how to hunt. And he and his brothers and sisters batted and clawed at it until it shuddered and expired. Did it think? He wondered. Did it feel? Did it understand it was old and could no longer defend itself? Even then, his tribe had not been large, never more than twenty. In those days, the prey were different. Bones, thick and long. Ridges over their eyes. They were the skins of other animals. Their teeth and claws were barely a threat to the long arms of his tribe, but sometimes they had other teeth made of stone, that they could hold in their hands. Sharp, glittering things that tore at your flesh. And then the prey had changed. A smaller, scrawnier sort of prey, with more stone teeth than the others, so that at first, the tribe still hunted boneheads. The thinner prey hunted the boneheads too, though. Not for food. Now between them, the supply dried up. This new sort of prey was harder to hunt and catch, even back then. They sealed themselves away in burrows, which gave way to hives, with the horrible crisscrossing branches exactly perpendicular to each other that made his eyes water and his stomach heave when he looked at them. And they had the burning light, like lightning but contained in a bundle of sticks. Still, he'd prospered, found a mate. He found that if he tried hard, he could recall the curves of her body as they lay together, and he had children, who ran wildly over the plains like he had. But the prey had grown ever further entrenched, and it seemed the more the prey swarmed together, the harder it was to get inside, to skip over into the twilight world that let them move between the walls and the floors of their hives. They ringed their hives with running water. The first time he had burrowed into that, he remembered the mind-consuming movement. 
was a taste of what the whole world would eventually become. How had he been captured? He thought for a moment that he could no longer remember, until the outlines of a narrative suggested themselves to his mind. But was it true? Well, who could tell? He'd been alone, perhaps for decades, the last member of his tribe. He could no longer recall whether it was his maid or one of his offsprings, but they'd vanished one day, like all the rest. He sometimes entertained himself with the thought that she might be still alive. And then he wondered what that meant. He wouldn't wish this, the disintegration or incomprehensible confinement on her or any member of his tribe. He thought he could remember waking one day, feeling hungry. More hungry than he'd ever felt in his whole existence. He roused himself from the near hibernation in the tree where he lived and he descended. The prey's hive nestled in the shadow of a hill on the far side of the lake. The old man remembered being far larger in his childhood. The prey drank at it. He'd realized one day long ago, and in their teeming thousands, they must have depleted it. When it was dry, the prey would be gone. And then, what would he do? He approached, moving over and through the earth, that they had pockmarked with their tall gold seeds, leaching the life out of it. The hive was bigger than he remembered and more dazzling, the luminescence the prey produced to light their way through the night that had once belonged to his tribe, catching of big, flat, reflective surfaces that seemed profoundly unnatural. Just one, he thought. He just needed one of them. Then he could sleep again. He would find one of the caves the prey made under their hives and sleep. He shivered as he passed through cold, yellow light. Here at the edge of the hive, they still had open areas around each burrow, though they had grazed the grass so thoroughly that there was almost nothing left. He remembered seeing one of them, small, tender in his mind's eye, and the old man drooled. He'd watched it for days waiting for a moment when it left the safety of the pack. These days, precious few moments. These things guarded their young so fiercely. Then, while it was running near its burrow, he took it, long arms closing around it and fingers searing into its flesh. A twist practiced many, many times and it was gone. He could not wait to hide. His hunger was too severe. His remaining teeth were already gnawing at the soft tissues of its nose and ears, even as he hugged the small body to him and shrank into the shadows of the tree line. Then the light and the pain. The prey had found him hours later, eating what was left of the infant, and shone their brilliant light in his eyes. Blows fell on the old man, crushing him. He felt something pop in his arm, something shining was looped between his wrist and the tree, and they went away. He tried to retreat to the fields in his mind, but the cold iron kept him here. He had found a way to escape it later, but that was after they had put him in a cell at the center of the maze. And then the white coats had come and taken him away, and the lights had grown brighter and the pain more intense. No food. No food. He was dying, he thought. Distantly starving, one day at a time. When he had been young, he had seen an old man die of starvation. He'd killed another member of the tribe, and no one would share their food with him. His limbs had hollowed out, and his skin had become like a dried leaf. For a long, long time, he'd hoped that others of his kind would come and find him that they would save him from this humiliation. But they would not relieve his hunger. He knew that. They would not share their food with him. He'd become that old man, and he had committed a sin. He could not remember the reason he had fought the larger male. Times had become hard and prey scarce, and the other male had failed the tribe. It occurred to him that the older male might have been his father, 
the old man remembered the onlookers, faces blurred and shifting, watching as he pummeled the larger male to the floor and put his hand in the other's skull and moved his fingers until there was no life in there anymore. But he had done no better, and his people had grown thinner and thinner and left him one by one to find richer hunting grounds elsewhere. And now he was alone. And as the years went by in the metal cell, he began to think an awful, awful thought. I am the last of my kind. Once, these bewildering creatures in white coats wouldn't have confused him. His mind would have been clean and sharp, and he would have navigated the horrible labyrinth outside his cell. Once. But not now. Now he wandered alone in the crumbling steel darkness, the pain in his stomach overwhelming what was left of him. I've lost everything, he thought. I lost everything. He twitched as he realized that in his distress, he had drifted further from his cell than he had ever done before. Those decaying corridors of mine fell behind him, and he found himself in what he thought was the waking world. Here the air was fresh, his old lungs exhaled suddenly, as though he'd been submerged in ice. He was in a small tunnel-like space like the burrows of foxes or badgers, but hard-cornered and metal in the fashion of the prey. Below him were slats of light, and he realized dimly that through them he could see the entire world of the white coats, clean, clinical. There was something wrong. Red lights were wheeling back and forth hypnotically. The white coats were running, rushing away to be replaced by others with blue hard hats and determined expressions. Then he smelt it, the scent of injured prey, so rich, so replete in memory, but so harrowingly distant, that he wondered if he'd have just imagined it, like so much else. But no, there it was again, the old man stirred his long black limbs, he raised himself up as far as he could his ragged nostrils sucking in the fresh, cold air. And his ears, dulled as they were, picked up that long-forgotten cry. The gibbering assemblage of syllables almost human as the prey called out in pain and fear. The dribble came thickly down his withered chin and dry old eyes moistened again as he remembered marrow and blood soaking into pink, juicy meat, just like it had been in the old days. No doubt the white coats would take this morsel from him, as they had taken it away before, but he didn't care. There wasn't enough left of the old man to care. He could only move down through the slats, towards the light and the old man came drip drip dripping down the wall thank you very much for listening if you enjoyed the video hit the subscribe button and then hit the notification bell next to that so you're notified when i upload new videos and then head on over to patreon.com forward slash D Sumerian and pledge at any level like everybody here on the screen already has, including MC Kashmil, who's pledged at $50, and Sinjariki, who's pledged at $100. It's nice to know that I'm not alone out here, and I will see you all again on Tuesday.